in Mark chapter 2, in verse 18, he notes that the disciples of John and the Pharisees, they were, they were fasting. And as I explained last week, voluntary fasting in Judaism had increased during the intertestamental period, and by the first century it had become an expected mark of piety. That was kind of how it was perceived a real devout or religious person would conduct themselves. But Jesus and his disciples, they didn't engage in regular voluntary fasts. And on the heels of being accused of blaspheming in claiming to forgive sins, you see in chapter 2, verse 7, and being questioned about his eating with tax collectors and sinners in chapter 2, verse 16, people ask him why his disciples don't fast like the disciples of John and like the Pharisees. And Jesus says that his disciples don't fast because the current period, the current period is like the celebration of a wedding feast when the groom is present. You see, we mentioned last week, when the groom is there, he is the signal for the, the festivities to begin. In his presence, and at that time, it is all joy and celebration. And he tells them, he says, look, uh, that the disciples don't fast because that's what the current period is like. And as David Wenham says he says the implication is that something joyful and significant like a wedding is taking place in Jesus ministry and furthermore that Jesus is the bridegroom at the wedding being the reason for the joy and celebration now this is a, this is a, an amazing thing to say and the joyful and significant thing that's taking place in Jesus ministry is his ushering in of the long-awaited kingdom of God. That was Jesus' message. As Mark says in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, linking the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, linking the kingdom to a feast is not surprising in light of a text like Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 8. It says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. So this connection you see between the kingdom and a feast is not at all surprising when you see Old Testament precedent in a text like that. Indeed, Jesus makes explicit the connection between the kingdom of God and a wedding feast. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 2, where he says, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he does the same thing in Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 to 13, and of speaking of himself as the bridegroom. In doing that, Jesus appropriates for himself imagery that in the Old Testament is used of God. You can see that in Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, a number of places, where this idea of the husband of Israel, the husband, the bridegroom is God. So this is a somewhat veiled identification of himself with God. That he takes that Old Testament imagery and applies it to himself. Now Jesus prophesies in Mark chapter 2 verse 20 that the joy and celebration and thus the lack of fasting, the joy and celebration his disciples properly exhibit in his presence that it will turn to fasting when he's taken from them. 
And that seems to be a reference, at least this is how I take it, it seems to be a reference to the temporary mourning they will experience at the time of his arrest and execution, but prior to his resurrection. The time that is spoken of in John chapter 16, verses 16 to 22. He's revealing, you see, he's revealing that his coming violent death is something that he knows and embraces. Now, we know that looking back on it. I don't know they would have known it then. But you can see that that's what he's doing here. When he says the time's coming when you're going to fast. You see, when he'll be taken from them. And so I think he's acknowledging and recognizing and indicating that he's aware of that and he embraces it. So Jesus indicates that fasting is not appropriate when he's physically present with the disciples and is appropriate when he's arrested and executed. But as the, far as it looks to me, he doesn't address the propriety of fasting during the period between his ascension and his return. You see, the time when he's physically in heaven but present on earth through the Spirit. He doesn't, he doesn't really deal with that. You see, that there's a sense in which Jesus is always with us, right? I mean, that's Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. But there's also a sense in which he's away from us. That's reflected in the prayer, Come, Lord Jesus, that you see in Revelation 22, 20, or in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, Our Lord, come. Or in Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians 5, 6, that while we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Okay, so there's a sense in which he's present with us, but there's also a sense in which he's away from us. We know that Jesus told the disciples in John chapter 16, verses 20 to 22, that their sorrow at his death will, at his resurrection, turn into a joy that will not be taken from them. You see, so their sorrow at his death will, at his resurrection, turn into a joy that will not be taken from them. And we also know that the church fasted on occasion after Jesus' ascension. You see that in Acts chapter 13, 2 and through, Acts 14, 23. So it seems, as I, I put these things together, it seems that fasting is acceptable, perhaps even expected. Okay, I say perhaps even expected because Matthew 6, 16 to 18 is not that clear on that. But it seems that fasting is acceptable as we long for the consummation and all that that will entail, including the Lord's full presence, but that this fasting is to take place in realization of this, in this overarching realization of the kingdom's inauguration. I keep showing you this. We live here in this overlap of ages. So though we, fasting is appropriate here in this overlap of ages, we fast here with a recognition and an understanding that we are in a different state, that we do live after the kingdom's inauguration. So this changes the perspective. It's something somewhat analogous to the way that, you know, we still grieve. Right? I mean, the kingdom's here, but there's still death and mourning and sorrow, and we still grieve in this overlap of ages. But Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, we don't grieve like others who have no hope. You see, so there's been a shift in perspective, and I think that shift in perspective also will affect how we fast. There is a sense in which we have a joy that will not be taken from us because we understand what has happened. Okay? But I still see that fasting is acceptable because I see the church doing it. All right. Now, after explaining in 2.19 to 20 why his disciples don't fast because, you know, the bridegroom is present. You see, it, it, this cause for celebration, this tremendous event, this momentous thing. After explaining why they don't fast, he says in verses 21 and 22, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. 
And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. Now, Jesus is telling them. Jesus is saying that the kingdom he is ushering in, the kingdom that he is inaugurating and pulling into the now, that it's such a radical new reality that it cannot be confined to the old patterns of Jewish piety. It's not a mere tweaking of the status quo. It is the kingdom of God invading the present age. Now, of course, Jesus didn't see himself as starting something completely new, something that had no connection to the past. Rather, he saw himself, as Wenham says, he saw himself as building on and bridging, or building on and bringing to fulfillment God's plan and purpose revealed in the Old Testament and in the history of the people of Israel. That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, that he's not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. You see, but to fulfill them. And the link to the past is indicated in texts like Matthew 13, 52. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. He brings out both of these things. As Wenham comments on that, he says, Jesus implies that Christian teachers are similar to the Jewish theological experts in some ways. And yet, whereas the Jewish teachers look back to the past, to the great figure of Moses above all, Jesus' disciples had not only the old, but also great new treasures as well. In Jesus and his message of the kingdom being the fulfillment of Moses and the prophets. You see, so we look back, we understand that he is the fulfillment, the flowering, the coming to completion of what was here. So we look back and see that, but we have new treasures. You see, we have these new treasures. Now, Wenham's conclusion about the untrunk cloth and the new wine, uh, I think it's worth quoting at length. He says, Jesus was not an iconoclastic revolutionary smashing everything that had gone before. But he did see his coming as bringing a decisively new stage in God's purpose. Once the space rocket's motors have fired and the rocket lifts off the launch pad, the space mission moves into a quite new and most exciting stage for which everything else has been preparation. So Jesus' ministry represented the liftoff of God's revolution. And things could never be the same again. As with Jesus' parable of the bridegroom and the feast, so with the parables of the patch and the wine, Jesus makes a remarkable claim for himself. He has brought God's promised revolution into the world. God has worked in the history of his people in wonderful ways, but now something of a decisively new order was taking place. Jesus ushers in the kingdom of God. It is lift off for God's revolution, for God's makeover of his sin-sick creation. This is a decisive moment. Now, you may recall that in Luke's account, in Luke chapter 5, verse 39, he has this the statement of Jesus, and no one after drinking old wine desires the new, for he says the old is good. And I think Wenham is correct in seeing that as an ironical comment on people's resistance to Jesus' ministry. As Wenham sums up the meaning, he says, the conservative old guard who were unwilling to receive the revolution of God are like people extolling the virtues of old wine, but this time the new wine, it is the new wine which is far superior. You see, and I think that's what that is. He's just looking back at people who are resisting the revolution and who are wanting to cling and turn back and freeze the old 
instead of letting the old flower into its purpose. And so that's what I think that little clause is. Now, in, in, in 2.23 to 28, Mark reports that on, on one Sabbath, Jesus' disciples, they picked heads of grain as they were traveling through grain fields. Now, according to the rabbis, that constituted reaping. You see, that picking those heads qualified as reaping, which was among the activities prohibited as working on the Sabbath. So you're not allowed to reap. What you're doing is reaping, so you are violating the Sabbath by working on the Sabbath. And they hold Jesus accountable for the disciples' alleged Sabbath breaking because Jesus is their master. He's the teacher. And here are his disciples doing what they claim is a violation of the Sabbath. Now, Jesus doesn't address whether the Pharisees are correct in considering the action to be prohibited work. He doesn't address that. Rather, he assumes for the purpose of argument. He assumes that picking heads of grain does indeed qualify as work on the Sabbath. He, you know, and it violates that regulation. And he indicates that the disciples are exempt from the requirement because they're with him. They're exempt from this. So he, just, he doesn't really address it, but he assumes for the purpose of argument that what they're doing is work that would violate the regulation, but he tells them they're exempt because they're with him. He suggests the situation is analogous to David's companions, and they're David also, but here the focus is on the companions. He suggests that the situation is analogous to David's companions eating the consecrated bread in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 to 6. Though only the priests, only the priests were allowed by law to eat the loaves from the table in the tabernacle's holy place, after those old loaves were switched out on the Sabbath, when new loaves would be put in, the old loaves would be taken out, and only the priests were to eat the old loaves. You can see that in, in Leviticus 24, 5 and 9. Well, though the, the, only the priests were allowed to do that, David's companions, they did so in that instance in 1 Samuel chapter 21 without culpability. They did so without guilt. And the lack of culpability, it's implied in the Old Testament text in the absence of any rebuke or any punishment from God or any negative assessment in the text that they had done wrong. And it's also evident in Matthew's account where Jesus adds in Matthew 12, 5 that priests working in the temple on the Sabbath are innocent of violating the Sabbath prohibition of work. Okay, so he's telling them there is no violation here. Jesus there thus implies that David's status, David's status as the Lord's anointed, as you see in 1 Samuel 16, 1 to 13, and the divine mission that was associated with that anointing, it took precedence in God's sight over that specific requirement at that time. David is God's chosen instrument. And he's on a mission. God has picked him and chosen him and anointed him to do something. And so in that case and in that context, what they were doing was exempt from that requirement. He then says the Sabbath was made for mankind, not mankind for the Sabbath. You see, and in that he's emphasizing that God intended, when he gave the Sabbath regulations, he intended for those regulations to have some play, some flexibility in unusual circumstances. So God is not contradicting his word in allowing an exception in the case of Jesus' disciples. Because he has always understood, he intended you to understand that these regulations were given for men, for people, mankind, not the other way around. That's what Jesus means in that final statement where he says, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. 
You see, his status and mission can take precedence over Sabbath requirements because he is the ultimate anointed one. He's the ultimate anointed one on the ultimate of missions. So he points them to David. He said, do you see that God's anointed in that situation? That his companions were exempt from culpability? Because he is the anointed and the mission that is connected with his anointing. I am the ultimate anointed. I am the Messiah. And I am on the ultimate mission. So how can you not understand that my disciples are likewise exempt? That's what he's doing. He's, letting, he's trying to get them to see uh, his, stats, his status and his mission. And by not recognizing that fact, by not recognizing that he is the Messiah and the consequences of that, knowing that the Sabbath, the Sabbath made for mankind, not mankind for the Sabbath, not recognizing that there is always intended to be some flexibility in play here, not recognizing that he is the ultimate anointed one on the ultimate emissions, and not appreciating what happened back with David. He winds up telling them by rec not recognizing those things they have, as he says in Matthew 12, 7, condemned the innocent. It's not like they're guilty. You have condemned the innocent. They were exempt because they were with me. Ooh, you see, Jesus understands an awful lot, you see, about who he is and what his mission is. Now, a great deal of ink has been spilled over this reference in, in uh, verse 26 to Abiathar, the high priest. Now, the high priest who gave David the consecrated loaves that high priest was Abiathar's father, Ahimelech. That's who gave him the consecrated bread. Now this is alleged by critics to be a mistake. That Mark simply is wrong when he says that, that uh, Abiathar was the high priest when David ate the bread. In fact, Bart Ehrman, who's famous now as an agnostic or atheist, uh, you know, this is the thing that he says was pivotal in his, quote, enlightenment kind of thing to see that, well, you know, the Bible's not really inerrant and this kind of thing. But I think you rush into judgment there. The key phrase and the one that's often translated when Abiathar was high priest or in the time of Abiathar. Well, that key phrase, you see, there's a, there's a little preposition there. It, the preposition is epi, epi. Okay, and so we have Epi Abiathar High Priest. And that little preposition, it normally deals with location. Okay, now it can mean in the time of, in the days of, but it can also mean in the place relating to Abiathar. In the section of Scripture relating to Abiathar. You say, well, why would you think it could mean that? Well, you have a good example in Mark 12, 26, where he says, have, have you not read in the book of Moses, epi, tubatu? This is this preposition, the bush. Have you not read in epi, the bush? And it's always recognized. That, have you not read? Have you not read in the book of Moses? It's always translated in the account or the passage concerning the burning bush. Have you not read in the place where that's talked about? Okay, so you have a parallel there of how that preposition functions as an indication of a section or place of Scripture. All right, so if you follow me, then your question's got to be, all right, well, look, why would Jesus refer to Ahimelech's giving him the consecrated, giving the consecrated bread to David, why would he refer to that as something in the Scripture relating to Abiathar? Why would he, what possible rationale could there be for that? Well, it may well be that 1 Samuel chapter 21 and chapter 22, dealing with Ahimelech and Abiathar respectively, those two chapters together, it could be that they're combined in traditional Jewish readings of Scripture on the Sabbath, in the lectionary readings. 
You know how you have certain, like we have lectionaries now, where here's the reading for this day. Uh, we don't do that, but there are other groups that do that. Okay, well, Jews did that. And it may well be that part of the lectionary readings included chapters 21 and chapter 22 together. And then Abiathar may have served as the landmark reference for that section of Scripture. That was known as the Abiathar text. Right? You say, well, why would you pick Abiathar? Well, as, as Craig Blomberg says, quote, Abiathar is the more noteworthy of the two priests throughout the larger context of 1 Samuel as the man who first brought the priesthood to David's side in his struggle against Saul. So it's certainly possible that you have a lectionary reading that combines them and that text is known as the Abiathar section or the Abiathar text. Why? Because he was the more prominent. Okay? So you, 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 somebody just race to that and say, okay, I can see why you would say that. But you're you know, you're rushing to judgment here. And this is how, you know, so oftentimes it's like, what do you want to think? You see, do you want to think that this is a mistake? Or do you want to take a breath and see how it may not be? You see, so anyway, I give that to you because you'll run across that. But I think it's, it's wrong to suggest that, no, that this is an error. I'm, I'm a guy who believes in the inerrancy of Scripture. I believe that God affirms nothing contrary to fact. Okay, there's a lot to understand about what is he affirming is true. You know, that can be difficult to sort out. But if we stipulate that I have correctly discerned what he is affirming as true, it is not contrary to fact because God is all truthful. Okay, that's essentially the idea behind inerrancy. All right, in chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, Jesus again, he enters the synagogue in Capernaum, that it's in Caper Capernaum is implied, on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees are watching for him to heal somebody so they could accuse him of working on the Sabbath as they had accused his disciples. You see, they got to him just because he was the master of the disciples. Now they're waiting for him to do something. They want him to heal somebody so they can jump him for working on the Sabbath. Now Jesus knows what they're up to, and he tells a man with a withered hand, you see, this person, his hand had atrophied because of some injury or disease. And he tells this person to stand up in the middle of everybody. So he's initiating this this time. He tells this person with the withered hand to stand up in front of everyone. He initiates the healing as a way of confronting the hypocrisy of his opponents. And it's just a dramatic scene. I mean, can you see, here he is, and he's got all these religious types here, and these wigs, and these teachers of the law, and here is this carpenter, and he has this guy stand up in this meeting, and you can just, you, you, I can just see the tension here. And with the disabled man standing in full view, he asked the Pharisees, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? to save life, or to kill. Now his question assumes that the nature of the activity done on the Sabbath, whether it's doing good or doing harm, whether it's saving life or killing, that that's the key to lawfulness. See, rather than simply the physical action involved. Now pose that way. The Pharisees, they refuse to answer. You see, what do they wind up doing? But they were silent. You see? Well, come on. We got everybody here. I got the guy here. I just ask you a question. Hmm. They're silent. Okay, well, they're silent. They're silent for a reason, you see. They're silent because that would force them to draw distinctions that they did not want to defend in a public debate with Jesus. Specifically, they'd be forced to argue that it was lawful, even required, to take action on the Sabbath that was necessary to save someone's life. That being a known position of theirs. They were on record. That was their teaching. 
That yes, you, you need to. It's lawful. It's something that's lawful even required for you to take the action necessary to save a life. But they'd have to acknowledge that. But then turn around and say, but it's not lawful to take action that's necessary to restore fullness to someone's life. That is the distinction they didn't want to get trapped into defending in a crowd, in a public debate with Jesus. And that distinction is vulnerable, you see. They knew that distinction was vulnerable because it relies on a subjective and dubious judgment that human life is valuable enough to justify life-saving action on the Sabbath but not valuable enough to justify life-restoring action on the Sabbath. That's what they didn't want to get caught because they knew that wouldn't sell. They knew that they would be exposed as having a silly position. And so they didn't want to enter into that. The question for the Pharisees, the question they fear is, look, if life is so valuable that action can be taken on the Sabbath to save it, as you agree. If life is so valuable that action can be taken on the Sabbath to save it, you see, if that's the case, on what basis do you insist it is not valuable enough that action can be taken on the Sabbath to restore it to fullness by healing? Explain that to the people, please. They don't want to do that because they know that's a loser. Now, whether the healing could be delayed as the synagogue ruler in Luke 13, 14, whether it can be delayed as he indicates, look, that's beside the point. That's beside the point. The question is not whether the healing could be done on another day, but whether the Sabbath requirement demands that it be delayed. That's really the question. It does not. It doesn't. You see, as the value of human life takes precedence over the Sabbath regulation so that the life can be saved, it likewise takes precedence over the Sabbath regulation so that life can be restored. And Jesus initiated the healing to deny emphatically the Pharisees' twisted understanding of the Sabbath regulation. He's exposing that, and he's angry. Here you see a reference to his anger, his righteous indignation. He's angry over their misrepresentation of God. You've got God over here and you are misrepresenting him. And you are the teachers of Israel. And he's angry over their misrepresentation and he's grieved by their hardness of heart. You see, by their refusal to engage him and thus to open themselves to enlightenment. You see, that they've already made up their mind. He asked them a question. And if they would engage him, he could lead them to enlightenment. But they don't want enlightenment. They have already made up their mind. They've already taken sides. And they have sided. They are enemies of the Messiah. They've already decided that. He then has the man stretch out his withered hand. And it's restored immediately. Now, here's another one of these things. This guy who's, I don't know how long, how, he's well known, but just, just healed. Just absolutely healed. And it's just amazing. Now, the Pharisees, after that, they go, they go out and plot with the Herodians how to kill Jesus. Now, the Herodians, these are people who are supporters of the Herod dynasty. You know, Herod the Great, who was there when Jesus was well, you know, he, he's there when Jesus is, uh, yes, he, Jesus is born before or after Herod dies. I'm having a brain cramp on that. Herod dies in, in four, and Jesus, Jesus is born right before Herod dies. Okay, so he's the great, but he has all these descendants. So you have this, this Herodian dynasty, and you have people who are supporters of the Herodian dynasty, which in Galilee... At that time, that would mean that they were supporters of Herod Antipas, who's the ruler of Galilee. He's the ruler of that section and also of Perea. 
Now, the Herodians and the Pharisees, they're really odd bedfellows because the Herodians, they are pro-Rome, and the Pharisees are anti-Rome. So it's really, it's really a strange coalition, but they found common cause in that both of them felt threatened by Jesus. So they were willing to build an alliance because they, they said, uh-oh, there's something with this, this guy that's going on here. In verses 7 to 12 of chapter 3. Now Jesus, he withdraws from Capernaum to the Sea of Galilee. You know, very close. But he goes from the town, he goes out to the Sea of Galilee. Now Matthew expressly attributes Jesus' move to the nearby Sea of Galilee to his awareness of the plotting to kill him. You can see that in Matthew 12, 15. Well, G Jesus drew huge crowds. Huge crowds as people from these various places flocked to him when they heard what he was doing. I mean, he was a buzz. People are hearing, you got to come see this guy. No, oh, no, yeah, I've heard about it. No, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. There was a guy with a withered hand. He and I'm telling I was there. I was there. There was a guy who had been paralyzed. He came through and he just got up and walked out. Oh, man, did you hear that? I'm telling you. So he's got these big crowds. They'd heard what he'd been doing. And he healed many people. So hordes, just hordes of people inflicted with diseases, they pressed around him and touched him. Now, if you're an introvert, and people laugh when somebody like, I am an introvert. Any test you got, I live in my head. That's what an introvert is. It doesn't mean that you can't talk to people. It means my world is in my head. And it's like John, he asked me one time, we're off somewhere. And he said, well, how was it? We're on a vacation or something. I said, well, when you live in your head, one place is just like the other. <laughs> you see? But, uh, I mean, if you're somebody like I am, you hear this with all of these people just pressing on and pressing on, demanding, demanding, and all that social interaction and doing it. You just see it, and it's just so intense. Jesus tells the disciples to have a small boat ready so he could get into it, see, to provide some buffer space. I mean, do you re literally, they're pressing on him. I mean, it's like being caught in some huge crowd, and you're just being pressed on from everywhere. So he says, get a boat so I can at least get a little bit of buffer space out here so I, he won't be crushed by the crowd. And whenever the demons who were possessing, that first or second bell, all right, whenever the demons who were possessing people, whenever they saw Jesus, the demons drove the person to fall before Jesus, immediately succumbing, succumbing to his overwhelming presence and acknowledged Jesus to be the Son of God. That's it. These people are possessed. They're driven to fall before him. And to proclaim that he's the son of God. But Jesus doesn't let them. He silences them. Again, this is to display his authority over them. And because they're inappropriate heralds of his person and his mission. They're not going to be the ones doing this. Announcing this. That's not for them. And so he does that. And then in 13, 13 to 19. He goes into the hills surrounding the Sea of Galilee, literally says to the mountain, but that's just an idiomatic way of saying he's going to the hills around the Sea of Galilee, and he summons those he wanted, and they come to him, and he selects 12 to be with him, to be his closest disciples, and to send them out to preach, and to have authority to cast out demons. And Mark identifies the apostles, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, we as the readers know now Judas is the betrayer, okay? The people in the story this will come later to them. But we as readers have already had, you know, that's been a spoiler alert. You see, 
But of course the church is reading this and the church is already uh, tuned into this. But he, he names them there. And they'd be sent to preach the kingdom of God. You see, the fact that Jesus was ushering in the long-awaited kingdom. They would be sent to preach that and they would exorcise demons as a sign of the kingdom's invasion. You see, that's what this is. And they would have this power to exorcise demons as an indicator that Jesus is in fact bringing in the kingdom. It's breaking into, the, into history in the person and ministry of Jesus Christ. Now from this point on, the term disciples in Mark, it refers almost exclusively to the twelve. And the fact that he chose twelve apostles, do you think that's just coincidental? You see, the fact he chose 12 apostles, it symbolizes the establishment of a new or a reconstituted Israel. You see, one that's, that descends in lineages of faith from the 12 true Israelites. You see, the 12 true Israelites, those who had the faith of Abraham in that they believed God's testimony about Jesus. You see, so it descends from these true sons by lineage of faith rather than through biological lineages. And so all reflected by their allegiance to Jesus. Now, of course, we know that something's going to happen with Judas and he'll be replaced, and that's the reason they replace him. Why? Twelve. It is symbolic. 12, it's symbolic. Now, all of that wouldn't have been evident at the time, but the tie of the 12 tribes, the fact he had 12 disciples, apostles, and there were 12 tribes, that wouldn't have been missed. You see, that would have been something that they understood. Now, in, in three, uh, 20 to 35, I got to bust this one up. I didn't want to put you to that big of an eye test. So I broke up three, 20 to uh, 35 into two slides. But Mark reports that, that Jesus enters an unidentified home in an unidentified location. And a crowd gathers around that is either so dense, so tightly packed, or so needy that Jesus and the disciples are not even able to eat. You see, they're either so needy that they're demanding such constant attention or they're pressing in so tightly that they're not able to eat. And when Jesus' family heard about it, that he was foregoing this basic human need of eating, when they hear about that, they assume that the pressure, the stress, and the intensity of his ministry had caused him to have some kind of mental breakdown. That he had, I heard that, that he just lost his mind. And so that's what they assume. So they plan to seize him and take him home to recuperate. That's what's going on. Now, what you're going to see is you have this, Mark does this a lot. You have this family's intervention starts. He then sticks in, inserts this story about Beelzebul and, you know, the, the blaming of, of, of the, what Jesus is doing is really demonic. And then he completes the story of the family's intervention. This is called an intercalation, this literary technique. And it ties these things together. And so that's what he'll do. And if I'm still alive next week, I'll carry on. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>